How are you? Man, I can't believe that you're here. <laughs> wow, what a crazy weekend of weather and the fact that you somehow dug out and came here blesses my heart. In fact, you know what? I'm going to make sure every one of you go to heaven. I'm going to do what I can. I'll, I'll give you some sort of, there you go. So you're in, your ticket is punched, but man, that, that shows a lot. Thank you for being here. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Troy. I'm one of the pastors here. Also, all of you are joining us watching online, which you could have done, uh, but you didn't. I love it. want to welcome you as well. Thanks for being here. And uh, hey, just a quick announcement. A cool thing happened to uh, one of our folks here in our church, and I just want to point it out. My good friend, Marco Cuevas, uh, right here. You guys know Marco and Karen. She teaches at SCA here. Marco just became the new director of Skate Church here in town. Yeah. I am so proud of that. He's been on the board for years, been supporting that. Obviously, he has a ministry that we work with in Cuba uh, using skateboards and, and uh, reaching people, and now going to be the director here and still teaching as well. So God bless you, Marco. Congratulations on that. I, I think they picked a great person to do that. So, Well, hey... Um, I was thinking about this message, we're, um, you know, in this series, and I was thinking about this this week, that I realized something, that uh, this, this coming September, I'm going to be celebrating a pretty big anniversary. Uh, it, it's pretty crazy. 35 years ago, this coming September, um, I said a prayer, inviting Jesus to become my Lord and Savior. 35 years ago. It's crazy, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I've never done anything for 35 years in a row except breathe and eat, but uh, I've been following Jesus almost 35 years. And Now, to some of you, that may not be a big deal, and that's okay uh, for some people, uh, but to me, it's huge. I wasn't raised in church. You know, I just had no background in that, and when I did that, I'd only been going to church for maybe about a month. It was kind of a crazy thing. Uh, a lady uh, whose daughter I was dating invited me to go to church with them. Now, my first impulse was to say, uh, no, <laughs> no, no, thank you, because church wasn't my jam, and church people were not my people back then, uh, but for some odd reason, um, I said, okay. Um, I, I, looking back now, I realized that I was kind of searching. I was in that place where I was just longing for something more. I was looking for answers, and uh, life wasn't going too great for me at that time. I was 21. 21 years old when I said that prayer. Uh, four years earlier, I had just graduated from high school. Does anybody know what high school I went to? Moco High, Moffat County High School right down the road in Craig. Uh, a lot of people, some of you are surprised that I graduated. I did. Uh, I graduated. And uh, uh, back then when I graduated in 86, I was so full of uh, dreams and hopes for my life. I was so pumped. Uh, I, I was ready to conquer the world. But over those next few years, man, things just kind of fell apart for me. They didn't go too well. Um, first of all, I ran out of money, and so I had to drop out of college. And, uh, and I was working at a warehouse in, down in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, Dillard's Distribution Center. My job was unloading trucks, and that was an okay, it was okay work, but that was not what I had kind of hoped and dreamed that I'd be doing. And over those years, I just kind of was losing my mojo. I mean, I, and, and I think, looking back now, that I was probably depressed. I was depressed. Uh, I, to deal with that depression, I began drinking and smoking more and more and more. I'd always been drinking and smoking, but I got into it a little bit more. And boy, that was starting to run its course because it just wasn't fun anymore. I'm just like, man, this, is, this isn't making my life any better, or making me feel any better. And so um, uh, I had some troubles with the law. Um, I, I, I lost my driver's license. I spent a night or two in jail. And boy, it was about that time I just realized I need, I need, I need time for a change. But I didn't know how to, how to change anything. I didn't know where to go or what to do. And so uh, when she invited me to church, uh, I thought, well, why not? <laughs> what else have I got going on? And so that Sunday morning, I got up early, and I put on my best shirt. I had a Corona beer tank top. I've told you about this. That was my best shirt. I mean, on Friday night, that thing was hot. I looked good in it, and I thought, well, I got to use my best. So I showed up at church with my Corona beer tank top and I went to church with them. And it was different than what I expected. I, I mean, I was surprised. Uh, the music, they played some songs that were kind of uplifting. I was like, that's got some motion and movement, and I get it. And, and, and then the message, I actually understood it, which was a new thing. I'd been to church one or two times before and didn't get anything out of it, but I understood it. And I was actually a little inspired. I was like, hmm, yeah. And so I just, and, but the thing that really caught me most was that the people, the people were super friendly at that church. Um, even though it was obvious that I was an outsider, 
You know, I had my tank top and my mullet and my earring. It was clear that I was not one. Uh, they welcomed me and they made me feel valued. And even they made me feel like they wanted me to be there, which was the opposite of what I felt at most of the clubs and the bars that I was going to. I, when I went there, I felt totally invisible. Like no one, people just looked through you, you know, and you just felt like no one cared. And, and, uh, but here I felt like people cared for me. And so um, after going to church for the next few Sundays... Um, the truth is, is I actually skipped the next Sunday because I thought, man, this is too weird to go to church two weeks in a row. That's too much. Can't do that. That was too funky for me. So uh, I didn't go to church that way. But after going to church those other following Sundays, on September 17th, 1989, I remember the day um, I said a prayer uh, inviting Jesus uh, to be my Lord and my Savior. Uh, Jesus said, come to me, anyone who is weary and heavy burdened and I'll give you rest. And I thought, okay, here, here I am. <laughs> Use me, take me. Uh, I wasn't sure that it was a good prayer. I wasn't sure that he'd be answered. I, I thought everything would probably just go the same. I thought, but it was a chance, and I was willing to give Christ a chance on that. And uh, man, uh, crazy. Two months later, on Thanksgiving weekend, I got baptized. Uh, man, I, my mom and my grandma came down. And they were visiting uh, me, and uh, they saw me get baptized in church. And uh, my life was changing for the better. But it, it, the best was still yet to come. God was working some things out, and he did some wonderful things over these years. And I just want to publicly say I am grateful for that little church, Praise Temple in Burleson, Texas. And I'm grateful for those people welcoming my weird self into their family. That changed my life. I bring this up because last week we started a new series called We. Everybody say We. We. And uh, since it's the beginning of the new year, we thought it would be good for us for, for, uh, to begin looking at what we, uh, the church, should be focused on. What, what are we here for? What has God, God, God for, got for us? And, and we know this. If you've read history, you understand that over the centuries, the church, the church has often forgotten uh, their role that they are to play in bringing hope and help to the world. Too often the church has turned into themselves, and it's all been politics and all of that. But here at SEC, we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. And so last week, we started the series off by looking at some things that the early church did that we should be uh, doing ourselves. Uh, we saw, first of all, how their intense devotion to, to, to follow Jesus, to, to live like Jesus. And we saw how their irrational generosity helped make their message of Jesus uh, irresistible to their community. There, there was a time in Christianity when people wanted to hear more about Jesus. There was a time when people would flock to come and be with people who were following Jesus. And so it was irresistible to them. And, and the church, uh, we're told that the church grew daily, that the numbers that were at the church were, were coming daily. It was a crazy thing. And we've seen that recipe kind of here work at SCC. Um, our commitment to follow uh, Jesus' example of love and being generous has opened the door to so many people's hearts. It, it just it's irrefutable when you're, when you're kind and when you're loving and when you're generous. People can't deny that. And we've seen hearts open up. I mean, literally thousands of people over the years have come and found hope and help here at this church. Because, uh, because, and a big reason of that is because of you. Or maybe I should say we, right? Because of what we did. And a long time ago, you may not know this, but a long time ago we made a decision that we would do anything short of sin to uh, reach people who don't know Jesus. We just realized, and, and that was kind of the heart that I had and the heart that the early church that was, I was here with, we just went, you know what? There's just too many people out there that don't know about this pearl of great price that we stumbled upon and have and, and, and that I missed for 21 years of my life. So my heart was is that we want to do anything short of sin to reach people. If we're going to reach people that no one else is reaching, that means we're going to have to do some things that no one else is doing. And so that was kind of our approach. Jesus himself said that he did not come here for the perfect. He did not come to earth to, to reach the perfect. He came for the imperfect. Uh, he, he said this in Mark 2.17. He said, it is not the well who need a doctor, but it is the sick. And that's why he came. He says, I have not come to call all you righteous, perfect Christians. I have come to call the unrighteous, those who are lost. We need to remember that the church of Jesus Christ isn't a gathering of good and perfect people, which is what I thought you all were, and when I grew up, I thought, I can't be with them. I can't go there. I'm not good and perfect. No, uh, the Church of Christ instead, we are a hospital for the hurting and the broken, and everyone is welcome here. 
Everyone is welcome. And so we're a hospital. So with that in mind, today I want to do is I want to look at a little story about Jesus. It's one of my favorites. Um, and it's so good because it shows Jesus' heart for the broken. It shows his heart for the broken and the hurting, but it also is a great illustration of how you and I, how we can participate in Jesus' mission to reach the hurting and the broken in our world. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Mark chapter 2. I just read a passage from the end of Mark chapter 2. Jesus made that statement at the end of this story, um, but we're going to go to the beginning. Jesus, in this point, give you a little context, has just returned back to his headquarters. If you don't know this, much of Jesus' ministry and much of his time was spent around the Sea of Galilee. He was always up near the Sea of Galilee, and the town that he would often stay in when he was up there was a small fishing village by the name of Capernaum. Capernaum was just this little village. It's probably where Jesus met Peter. Uh, many people think that that's where, that was Peter's hometown. And many of you have gone to Israel and you visited with me uh, Capernaum, which is called Jesus Town. And it's kind of, the ruins are still there. And, uh, and, and Jesus spent most of his time there. The people in Capernaum adored Jesus, man. They, they found it a blessing that he hung out there. And he, and he often found himself hanging out and talking to the people about the new kingdom that he was bringing to the world. And from time to time, people would hear that Jesus was back in town and they would run to wherever he was staying so that they could see and listen to what he was saying. And large crowds would eventually gather around these little homes that he would stay at uh, while he was teaching. And one day, uh, he was speaking in a home, and Mark tells us that the people that had gathered there in such large numbers that there was no room left inside the house. I mean, every inch of it was packed with people. There was not even place outside the door. People were kind of lined up at the doors and the windows. Mark tells us that while Jesus was preaching the word, talking to them about the kingdom, something interesting happened. Four men carrying a paralyzed man on a mat showed up. And since they could not get Jesus, get this guy to Jesus because of the great crowd that was there, <laughs> they did something interesting. They made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it. And then they lowered this man who was lying on a mat. And when Jesus saw what they did, um, he said to the paralyzed man, he said, son, your sins are forgiven. Which is an interesting statement. That's kind of a crazy statement for him to make in the middle of this crazy uh, situation. Now, I'm going to get to that in a little bit. But uh, like I said, um, I love this story. And, and uh, when I was a youth pastor, some of you know this, I was a youth pastor in Craig for about four years, and Julie and I were youth pastors in California. I would often talk about this story to my teenagers and students uh, because there was so much good stuff, and it's just a simple, cool story about Jesus. Um, first of all, one of the things that I see in this story is I see all kinds of different kinds of people in the story that I think represent the types of people that you will find in a church. That, it, that there are just all kinds of people in the story. That are like, that are, that are, I, in fact, I see five different types of people in the story. And if you look around today, you will find each one of these people here this morning. And as we read this story, I want you to think about not who they are, but who you are. Which one are you? Where are you at in this story? Which one represents you? And I think that'll be good. So first off, let's jump into this. In every church that you go to, every church that you visit, I promise you, you will see someone in need. Every church will have somebody who is in need. Uh, in this story, it's, of course, the paralyzed man. Uh, this guy couldn't walk. Um, he was probably a beggar. He completely depended on the generosity and the help that he got from other people. He was in significant need of help. I mean, he could not walk. Imagine what that would be like. This guy's body was completely uh, broken, and he was incapable of taking care of himself. He couldn't do what he had to do just to take care of himself, to get anywhere, to do anything, he needed other people. He needed help. He needed at least two or three people. He would get on a mat, and two or three or four people would pick him up and carry him to wherever he had to go, to go home or to be set out in this public square to beg or to go to the store or anything. He needed help to get everywhere. And here's the thing. Uh, whenever I talk about, whenever I used to talk about this story um, uh, with young people, uh, I would often tweak it a little bit just to kind of keep it interesting and keep their attention. I'm already losing your attention, so I'm going to do the same thing here. For example, one of the things that I would do is I'd give each one of the characters that don't have a name in the story a name. I wanted to give some names, so I'd make it real. So to help them, I would do that to make it simple. I'd ask this question. For example, I'd ask the students, what shall we call the man who was sitting on the mat? Matt, thank you, Charlie. You're paying attention. Matt, exactly. And they would yell, yeah, we should go Matt. So we named the man on the mat, Matt. It's simple. Now, in every church, this is my point, in every church, 
there's a mat. In every church, every weekend, there's someone there who is in need. And again, I, I just wonder maybe if that, that's you this morning. Maybe that's why you're here. You came this morning because you're in need. You need something. Maybe you're not crippled, uh, but maybe, maybe your heart is broken. Maybe today is just a tough day. Maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe there was a breakup. Maybe there was a divorce. Maybe you lost a loved one. Yesterday we had a memorial service for a mom in our church who was in her early 40s, lost her life after eight years of battling brain cancer. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of need in there. Maybe you're feeling that and you're in need because your heart is broken. Or maybe uh, there's a family member that you love that is near and dear to you that is struggling and is in need and you're just helpless. You feel like, I I don't know what to do. I want to help, but I don't know how to help this situation. Or maybe more normal, many people are here, there might be here some financial need. Maybe you're just not making it. Steamboat is incredibly tough. Yampa Valley has been hard and you're just, uh, you're a few, you're just some bills, you need some bills paid. You're here this morning and you're like, God, help me on that. Or maybe you're feeling depressed or maybe you're feeling anxious or maybe you're feeling lonely, which I think a lot of people do feel. Or maybe you're just feeling a little lost, you know, like, like I was, that, you're, that you realize that the path that you've been on is going nowhere fast and you need to make a, a change. You need a new direction. Here's my point. Whatever it is, I just want you to know something. You're not alone. <laughs> there are other people that are feeling the same way and there are a lot of people here in need. In every church, you will find people who are in need and that, that, I'm glad that you're here. But here's the good news for you. In every church, number two, you'll also find someone who cares. I believe that. You'll find someone who cares. You're probably, in fact, sitting next to someone who actually cares. You're you're like, I don't know them. Well, they they may not know you and you don't know them, but I'll tell you what, if they knew you and they knew what your situation was, I I would be willing to bet that most of these people would be quick to help in some way. I just, I, I believe that. I think there are people every week that come to church and they don't listen to the message at all. They're just looking. Who in here could use some help? Because I want to help someone. That's why they came. And I love that about our church. In this story, we see four guys, four men, who are bringing Matt to Jesus. And uh, we don't know if these guys were longtime friends, or we don't know how they met, or if they just met. But one thing we know is that they clearly cared about him. They went and made a little eff- extra effort to help their friend. Um, they probably had names. I don't know what their names are, but I call them Bubba, Bo, Bert, and Bob. That's what I'd call them. And, and, and because I just felt like these were just some good old boys. Some, probably some red. They're probably fishermen, right? I mean, they lived in Capernaum. That was a fishing village. Four guys hanging out. Probably been fishing out. I imagine these guys have been out all night long. That's when they fished. And they got, you know, they've been bring, drinking a few brewskis or some empty cans in the boat when they pulled up. And they see people walking through the village early in the morning. And they're like, what's going on? And they hear that Jesus is back in Capernaum. And they're like, hey, what are you going to do? I don't know. Let's go see him. And so they, they decide to walk and, and go find him. And as they, as they are walking there, um, they, they see Matt just kind of sitting maybe against a wall, and he's watching everybody walk to Jesus. And they can just see that. And I, I imagine that baby Bert was like, hey, guys, didn't, didn't Jesus heal a blind guy? Didn't you guys hear about that? Yeah. And, uh, Bob was like, yeah, man. Uh, in fact, I heard Jesus raised a dude from the dead. And they're like, yeah, and I, and I bet you Bubba probably said, you know what, if, if Jesus could do that for them, maybe he, could, maybe he could do the same thing for Matt. And so these four guys, maybe this is how they happened. They ran over and they picked Matt up and they began to carry him. And we don't know how far they had to carry him or how hard that was for them, but again, we know that they cared enough to bring Matt to Jesus. And when they got to the house, um, they saw another type of person that we often see in churches. Uh, In every church, you'll see someone in need, you'll see someone who cares, but you'll also see someone who is preoccupied or distracted. Some of you right now are just like, get this going, I'm trying. But there are people in every church that are distracted. They're missing the mark. They're missing the point of what this is all about. They're caught up and they're counting the tiles on the ceiling or the lights, or, or, or they're just focusing on the wrong thing. They're preoccupied. Mark says this, that the house was full of people. It was wall-to-wall people, 
crowded inside and out. They were in the windows and the doors. And, and so when these four guys, I want you to imagine, when they, these four guys pull up to this house, they realize instantly there's no way that they can get Matt inside to see Jesus. It's just packed. And no one cares. I just want to show you a little bit about what they might have saw. I'm going to give you an illustration of what Capernaum might have looked like. Someone kind of picked a picture. He's on the Sea of Galilee. That's kind of what looks like the hillsides there. And, and you can see that Capernaum was a village. We can go there. There's ruins of many of these homes. And you can see some of them are two stories high. Most of the homes are built with a, a basalt kind of rock, a volcanic rock that they just picked up in the fields behind them. And they built these homes and they patched in the, 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 the little spaces in between. And then on the roofs, they would make the roofs interesting. They would lar- lay large beams across the roofs there, big heavy poles. And then on top of that, they would go and collect reeds from the seashore and they would lay that on top. And then on top of that, they would put mud and straw and manure and they'd pack it in on top of that. And when it would rain, it would soak it in. And then when it would dry, it would seal the roof. It was a great uh, roofing material. Well, Mark says that when these guys walked up to these houses, all they saw were just people surrounding it. They were all jammed in and around the house watching and listening to what was happening inside. In other words, the backs of the people were literally turned to these four guys and Matt as they walked up. Their backs were literally turned away from the guy who was in need. Uh, most, most, if not all, of those people were oblivious to Matt outside and to uh, his desperate situation. Why? Because they were preoccupied. They were focused. They were so enamored with what was happening on the inside of the house, they completely ignored what was stand, standing outside the house. I, I would just suggest to you that that's most churches, many churches. We just, you know, many churches, the, the tendency of church is to turn inward, <laughs> to build high walls and to focus only on who's here and what's going on and to forget about and to not pay attention to. Or I know that most, many people who go to church, they go to church for themselves. I need to get filled up and, and that's good. But what they forget is that there are people next to them who are on the outside looking in. And, they're, and, they're, and, they're, and, and are, we're distracted. We don't even know. And I wonder how many times people come to church as a last straw. This is the last place you want to go for help. <laughs> Most people in this community, the last place they go. But then they go. And no one says hello. No one says, how are you doing? They just come in and they go out because we might be so preoccupied with that. And sadly, I think that describes all church. But the good news is that these good old boys, uh, they, they wouldn't be deterred. They were going to help Matt one way or the other. Bubba sees the situation, and I, I bet he says, oh, man, this isn't working. This ain't going to work. Guys, we need, to, we need to do something more. We need to do something more to get Matt inside to Jesus. We need to do more. And one of those guys, Bob, is probably like, yeah, to get Matt to Jesus, we're probably going to have to do something that no one else is willing to do. Right? And, 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 and Bert goes, well, I got an idea. How about we just call, we just yell out, fire! That'll spread this thing open. And they're like, ah, oh, I better not do that. And then, then Bo is like, well, man, we, we can start a fight. I can start a fight. That'll break this thing up a little bit. And they're like, no, that, that's not good either. And then Bubba stands there and he's looking up on the roof. Just kind of staring at the roof and he's looking up there and he turns to the guys and says, here, hold my beer. I'm going up top. So Bubba climbs up on top of this two-story building and he starts peeling off that dirt and that manure and, and, and that mud and he's flipping it up and, and the other guys see what he's doing and so they, they go up and instantly join him and, and the people inside the house, they can hear the noise and the knocking and the creaking and they can see the dirt falling and they're, all, they're just sitting there going, what's going on? And all of a sudden, suddenly a hole appears in the middle of the roof and, and all of a sudden a, a big old Bubba's face looking down in there. And then all of a sudden he disappears. And everybody's just like, what's about to happen? And then all of a sudden they see this man being lowered down on a mat by rope. He's being, and you can hear him like, well, be careful. And then he's coming down. And all of a sudden he gets down and he stops at about eight feet off the ground. And everybody's like, what's happened? He's just kind of swinging there. And then all of a sudden uh, you hear one of the boys up there going, hey, Bubba, the ropes aren't long enough. And then you see Bubba's face peer down there. And he looks down there and he goes, well... You hear him say, well, he's already paralyzed. 
This is doesn't drop them on count three. One, two, three. Watch out below. And boom, Matt hits the ground, bounces. And it's just crazy. And, uh, and Jesus is watching all of this. And he's impressed. And, uh, and Matt is sitting there. And he's just kind of on the floor. And he's got kind of an embarrassed smile. And he's like, hi. <laughs> Sorry to drop in like this, you know. And, uh, but Mark tells us what happened. Mark says this, that when Jesus saw this, he was amazed. When Jesus, it says this literally, it says, when Jesus saw their faith. I love that. It is possible to see someone's faith. You know, faith isn't just an internal thing. It's not just something that's on the inside that you can't see. It's not just that I believe in Jesus. Faith is something that you can see. Faith is something, their faith was so strong and so real, it showed through their actions. One of, one of them said, if you tell me you have faith, I say, show me. One of the apostles said, right? And so uh, the, it, you can see their faith. And that is true for us. Our faith can be seen by the way that we live and the way that we love. Now, I get it. The Bible tells us that we are saved by faith. We are saved by faith in Jesus through his grace. And that's true. But boy, it is clear. Faith isn't just a personal thing. It's not just something for myself. It's not just an internal thing. Um, our faith should be visible and seen through what we do by how we serve. For example, our faith should be shown by when there is a need or something going on in the church. God bless some of you that got up this morning and saw 10 feet of snow outside your door and you were called to here to make coffee and you came and did that. And that's faith. <laughs> that's, not, that's an extraordinary faith to me. I would have called in sick today. I thought about it. I did. I actually called myself. I'm not coming in today, Troy. <laughs> Faith can be seen by the way you give when you run into someone who's in need and that you're quick. You're going, yeah, what do you need? That's faith. Uh, by the way you forgive. When someone does you wrong and you're like, God bless you. <laughs> I'm forgiving you. And by the way that you help those who are around you. It says this, that when Jesus saw their faith, he then did something strange. He said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> like I said, uh, that was kind of a weird statement. I mean, I, for the four guys who carried Matt there, they were like, what? <laughs> no, he's forgiven. That's, Jesus, that's not why we brought him here, but, you know, whatever. And Matt probably heard this, and he's like, wait, what? I'm, I'm forgiven? Hmm. Well, uh, thank you for that, Jesus. That's really nice, but that's not what I want. That's not what I want. What, what I want, I want to be healed. <laughs> I want to walk. That's what, that's what I want. He wanted to be healed, but Jesus forgave him for his sins. That's weird. And that reminds me of a very important principle that we often forget. If you're a follower of Christ, you better know this about Jesus. And that's this, that sometimes, and I learned this when I came to Christ early on, sometimes God gives us what we need before he gives us what we want. I see some nodding heads. I don't know if you know that. But sometimes Jesus gives us what we need before he gives us what we want. We all want something for God. We all want God to do something for us. We want our problems to go away. I'm in trouble, God, and I need you to fix this problem. I want you to fix this problem. I, I want you to do a miracle in my marriage or in my family. I want, we want God to give us what we want. But here's the thing. God often has more for us than just that. God has what we need, what we really need. And he sometimes gives that to us first, and it's frustrating to us because he's not fixing our problem, <laughs> but he's doing something else. And, and I'm telling you, sometimes what you need more than your bills to get paid, you, what we need more than, you know, maybe finding a new husband, or more than finding a new job, is to have God back in the middle of our lives and our hearts. I believe God sometimes allows troubles in our lives to stop us and to go, oh, man. I mean, I heard yesterday at that funeral, if everything was perfect down here, we wouldn't have need for God. And when things fall apart in our life, it causes us to stop and say, God, I need you. I need what you have for me. And so sometimes God gives us what we really need before he gives us what we want. And so you just need to know that. And so, in every church, we see someone who's in need, we see someone who cares, we see someone who's preoccupied or distracted, and of course, we see someone who's critical. 
In every church, there's just people that are just church ladies, judging everything, looking at everything, criticizing everything. And, and, and we see it here. In verse 6, it says this. Now that uh, in verse 6, now they, uh, some of the experts of the law, the Bible thumpers, the Bible experts were there. They were thinking to themselves, why does Jesus talk like this? I mean, he is blaspheming. He, he can't forgive sins. Jesus, no, there it is. No one can forgive sins except God. What are you doing? They were critical. They're like, that ain't biblical. What you're doing isn't right. That's not how, God, first of all, you guys that got the tattoos and you're up on the roof, tearing up the roof, listen, who do you think you are? This isn't, this, we don't do church that way. That's not the way we should do church. There's a way to do church and there's a way you do it and you shouldn't do church that way. Or, or secondly, Jesus, who do you think you are? I mean, gosh, uh, you can't forgive sin. Only God can do that. Clearly, y'all are messed up and you all are sinners. They were just critical. They were criticizing everything. And, and here's the thing that we got to remember. Uh, this is the truth. Uh, Jesus never stopped for critics. Uh, he never stopped for critics. It ne they never stopped them. They were always around. There were religious people who were always criticizing him. They were always criticizing his unorthodox methods. They, were, they, were, they, they forgot the heart. They didn't care about what he was doing. Are you really helping this person get their donkey out of the ditch? It's the Sabbath by God. Let that donkey stay there until tomorrow morning. They were just criticizing. They, they would get caught up and messed up by the methods and they would forget the heart. And Jesus never stopped for them. He never did that. He was on a mission from God. Why? Because Jesus had one mission. I've come to seek and save the lost, and I will do anything short of sin to help them. He didn't come for the prideful and the perfect, and so if you got your act together, you know what's best, good for you. He wasn't coming for you. He came for the humble and the sinful and the broken. And so he ignored them. I mean, he just moved on. Verse 10, it says this, so Jesus said to the man, something interesting. He says, I tell you, as he's amazed by this, he says, I tell you, get up and take your mat. Everybody say, take your mat. Take your mat. And go home. And what Mark writes next, the power is lost because it's just words in black and white. But here it says, he got up, he took his mat, and he walked out in full view of them all. In other words, everybody saw this happen in real time. They saw this man who had never walked before get up, roll his mat, and walk out of the house. This amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, Pfft. I've never seen anything like that. That's amazing. Jesus not only gave this man what he needed, forgiveness, but he gave him what he wanted. This man wanted to walk. He wanted to walk. And Jesus said, uh, take up your mat and go home. Walk home. Walk home. You don't need to be carried around anymore. The thing that you have been depending on uh, your whole life, that mat, no longer necessary, no longer needed. Some of you can identify that, with that. Some of you, you know, like all of us do, somewhere along the way, you found a crutch to help you deal with life, to help you deal with life, and you know that that really never worked anyway. Most of the crutches that we find, it just never worked that well for you anyway. For some people, it's alcohol. Others, it's drugs, you know. You know, you're, you, you, you drink alcohol so you can, get a little, you can feel better, have a little bit of joy. Smoky, smoky, just to feel a little peace. And both of those were very fleeting, and they run out, and they just don't work. And Jesus said, man, listen, take up your mat and, 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 and walk away. You don't need that stuff anymore. You have me. I am the prince of peace. I will give you a peace that passes understanding. I am fullness and joy. In my presence is fullness of joy. Eternity of joy coming to you. You don't have to hook it up. You don't need it anymore. Maybe, maybe you have a grudge that you kind of carried with you your whole life. Somebody did something to you and you've just that's your excuse and you bring it up and you remind yourself of what they did and you're bitter and you're angry and Jesus would say, would you just forgive them and, and forgive him? You don't need that excuse anymore. I am with you. We're moving forward. Uh, maybe for you it was a, t a relationship that that relationship was everything to you, it was your security, and, uh, but it was toxic, it was crazy, you knew it, but you were more afraid of being alone than being in that. 
And that was hard, right? And Jesus would say, hey, man, you don't need that anymore. Take up your mat and go home. Get away from that craziness. You are forgiven. You are free. (laughs) You are healed. And go and tell somebody. Tell someone who I am and how I have changed your life. Tell them to pick up their mat and to come follow me. And here's the thing. And this is the last person. Uh, In every church, we are all someone who can be changed. In every church, every one of us is a candidate to experience change in our life. Every one of us can be changed. Scripture tells us, it doesn't matter what you've done or who you are or what you've gone through, that he says, the Scripture says this, 2 Corinthians says that if anyone comes to Christ, he is a new creation. If anyone comes to Christ, they are brand new. The old is gone and the new has taken its place. It's interesting, the Greek word for new there is fascinating. I won't tell you what the Greek word is because I can't pronounce it, but uh, I will tell you that the Greek word for new there isn't like the new that you and I think of. It's not like the new, uh, new Jeep Cherokee, the new 2024 Jeep Cherokee. That's what we think the new is. It's the new and improved Jew. It's better than last year's model. The new in this passage says it this way. It's a new, it's not a new Jeep Cherokee. It's a new kind of vehicle altogether that's never existed It's something so much better, so much far. It's like, that is just antique. This is something brand new. That's what you and I are. When I came to Christ, uh, man, before I came, destined for destruction. I had no eternity, no destiny, or my destiny was bad. I had nothing. I was dead inside. But when I came to Christ, all of a sudden, I became a child of God. I was one of God's kids. I was one of the king's kids. And and God had deposited life in me and and a promise and a destiny. And I was headed somewhere and I had things to do. And I I was, uh, man, I was called by God. And the same spirit that was in, that was, that raised Jesus from the dead was inside of me. That's something totally brand new. It's not like the old version of Troy. And that's who we are. And with Christ, we are all someone who can be changed like that. And I am proof of it almost 35 years ago, September 17, 1989. I asked, I came to Christ and my life has never been the same. I have no clue what it would have been like, but I don't, I wouldn't trade anything. And in the same way, God can turn your situation around if you'll simply invite him, if you'll come to him. In fact, this weekend, today, last night, uh, we had several people that have come and want to get baptized. They want to testify to this new. And see, they're, in a minute, they're going to get into this tank, and they're going to stand there and say, like, Jesus, I'm going to die, but I'm going to be buried, and I'm going to come out of that, and I'm going to be raised from the dead. And when they go under the water, it represents that old is gone. The old them is dead and buried and no longer <laughs> matters, and something new is in its place. Some new creature with a destiny for eternity is in, standing in its place. That's what there are many doing. We had six last night. I know that we have a few that have come this morning may brave the weather. In fact, if you're here this morning, I want to dismiss you real quick to go get ready and get baptized. Uh, there's search and t- towels. If you, maybe you've never been baptized. You're like, man, that looks like cold water. It's, it's warm in there, man. It's nice. We would love to celebrate this new life. If you've never been baptized or if you haven't been baptized since you began to follow Christ, this is your next step and we'd love to celebrate with you. So let's give a big hand to those guys that are already going baptized. I saw a couple of them get out. Amen. Cool. So while they go, let me just real quickly ask you a question, uh, and I'll close. Which one are you? Of the five people that we find in the church, which one of those people most represent you? Uh, You might be more than one. Uh, Maybe you're the preoccupied. Maybe you're just distracted. Uh, uh, Maybe you're kind of oblivious to the people that are around you and who are in need. Uh, Maybe you just kind of, you do your thing, you come to church, you go home. You know, and you're distracted and you're missing. There's an opportunity here uh, to do that and that you're too busy or you're too self-involved with your own thing. Um, Maybe you're critical. Uh, Maybe you've just kind of like, man, I'm just tired of this fat, bald preacher or the music I don't like or whatever. Or, and, and you're just missing that there's someone sitting next to you down the row that is in need. And maybe God has brought you here today for them. I'm telling you, in every church, there's a person who is in need. And this is a great place to be if you're in need. Why? Because there are a lot of people who care. There really is. There are people that show up here every day, uh, every weekend, and I'll tell you what they do, and I love it. They, they walk in here, and they, they may not even miss, listen to the message, 
They're just looking around. They got like their, my friend Marco calls it Pradar. Beep, 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 beep. And they're just looking for someone. And they're scanning and they can see, beep. And they see someone that's just got their head down. And they, and they, they can't listen to anything else that's going on because they're like, what's going on here? God, do you want me to go? I want to, I want to, man, I want to deputize and authorize every one of you to do that. To walk in here and ignore the message and to look for someone in this church that is hurting. The, their suicide is real. We get one shot. I don't know what it takes for someone to have the courage to come to church nowadays, but if they ever come in here, my prayer, and I worry that someone does come in and then no one says hello, no one says anything. Don't you walk out of here without going to that person and going, hey, I'm Troy, what's your name? You don't have to use my name, you can use your own. Hey, what's your name? What are you, what are you doing? I, 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 I don't want to be too forward here, but man, I just, I just sense that something's going on. Is there anything I can pray for or do for you? Many of you need to do that every week. I'm telling you, there are people in here that are needing help and you care. In fact, if you're here this morning and you're a person that cares and you'd be willing to help someone, would you raise your hand right now? Hey, Amen. Look around, look around. All of you who's, who need help, look at these people with their hands raised. Go to them. You got it. All right, no, I'm joking. Why? Because we are the church. Come on down here, you guys. We are the church. And the church, we don't just go to the church. We are the church. And the church isn't just a gathering of good and perfect people. The church is a hospital for the hurting and broken. We are here to care for those who need help. And the truth is, is we all are going to need help from time to time. Amen? Amen. Let me pray. And then uh, we'll, we'll get into this and have some people get baptized far out. Father, thank you uh, that you help us. That you came to us when we were in need. You didn't wait for us to even ask. You came to earth way before we ever had our act together. You came and you helped us. And we want to follow that example. Help us to have eyes to see. Help us to have our prayer on. Help us to have the courage to talk to people in the grocery store. Or when we talk to people and they tell us something bad going on in their life, we don't just say, hey, you know what? I'll pray for you. That we would just go, let me pray for you right now. Right now. I I know we're in line at City Market, but I have a feeling that I've got to do this. I'm here to help. Lord, help us to be that kind of bold people, those kind of crazy folks for you, that we would be like these four men. We would do whatever it takes to help people find Jesus. We'd tear the roof off off of a building if we had to. Um, Lord, let's be that kind of church, I pray. And I pray for these folks that are getting baptized. As we watch them go down in the water, help us to remind ourselves of that, that truth for us, that as they come up out, that is the hope that we have, that though we yet shall die, we will yet live again. That is our promise, and that we will celebrate this new life, this new thing that you're doing in their lives. We love you, and we thank you for allowing us to see this miracle. In Jesus' name I pray, and all God's children say amen to that. All right, are we ready? Yeah, go ahead. Well, hey everyone, we have Mary here. We have Mary here and um, she has decided that she wants to follow Jesus. And, and she's been following Jesus and she said, um, this church has really been here for her. She, she said, I could say this, but she lost a son. Um, and she said during that time, this church, you guys, Troy, everyone was here for her. She, she wants to declare what she's decided in her heart. And so, Mary, have you decided to follow Jesus? Absolutely. 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 So we're going to celebrate that decision and baptize her right now. So when she comes out, we're going to go crazy. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is the praise making dead men walk again. Hope in the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of time for trying to live. So this is Elliot 
She is in middle school, seventh grade, sixth grade, and um, she has just been following Jesus, going after him, and she has decided that she wants to show everyone what's going on on the inside. So, Elliot, have you decided to follow Jesus? Yes. Heck yes. Let's go. So we are going to celebrate that decision, sixth grader standing up. So when she comes up, we're going to go crazy again. Let's go. you guys for coming this morning. I hope that encouraged you and helped you in your faith. It did mine. A uh, couple things I just want to make, ask you to do. In the seat back in front of you is a little card that says, do you need help? And I want to make sure that you're aware of the help that's available here. So many different ways that we can help you. Or maybe you know a friend or a family member or a neighbor that's in trouble. This could be a good resource. So make sure you take a look at that. If you need prayer, if you need some help, tangible help, we're here for you. Talk to the person next to you. Or you can come on down here. I'll hang out with some of my leaders. We'd love to do that. And also, if you're new, I don't know, maybe we're not doing that this morning. Charlie will be there. If you're new, we would love to meet you. We have a gift for you over here. Charlie will meet you over at the First Timers. And lastly, make sure you go and love on these people. Congratulate them on that. Let's give a big hand to Jesus. Thank you guys for coming. Man, have a great, be careful going home. Thank you for coming to church this morning. God bless you. We'll see you guys. Amen.